Welcome to the third lecture for week eight, which has to do with lesson 8.2 on death and uh, end of life care. So I'm going to remember to share my screen this time and hit share, get rid of that. And we are going into the week eight overview, going into dying and end of life care. And let me view a student. There we go. And so again, we have our objectives, our reading, the activity and the journal. And so we're going to go to 8.2, the lesson. And um, centering on death and dying and end of life care. Um, children's concepts of death are explored. We did look at that in the previous PowerPoint a little bit. Um, as well as types of loss and grief. So some of this may overlap. Um, so hopefully if we can know what to expect, it may be easier to provide care and support loved ones um, during this time. Sorry about that. I just like fully messed that up. Uh, learning objectives for the course, learning objectives for uh, the lesson in particular. Here's your reading again. We went over the activity. Um, and the journal entry in the um, first video for this week. And so we'll move into the lesson. And so um, comparing and contrasting hospice care and palliative care. Um, I like this um, graphic here because it has palliative services here and hospice services here. I think most people are fairly familiar with hospice services. So um, it is covered under Medicare and Medicaid and, and private insurance. Um, the prognosis has to be six months or less. You can um, renew. They will do another um, evaluation every six months. Um, if you are to have any type of curative treatment, then you must come off hospice services. So, for example, um, like a lung biopsy or something, you'd have to come off hospice, and then they would have to restart you when you came back. Um and it can happen wherever the patient calls home. So it can be long-term care at their own home, it can be in the hospital, um, wherever that person is. And then if you look at palliative services, those are usually self-paid, although if they are provided through a hospice, then oftentimes the Medicare and Medi uh, Medicaid will cover. Um, but just palliative service, independent palliative services would be through insurance. Um, and self. And that can be at any stage of the disease. It can be at when you first find out you have the disease. It can be towards the, the end. Um, it's the same time as curative treatment. So when you're going through, um, say, if you have cancer and you're going through chemo or radiation, those types of things, you can have palliative care at that time. You cannot be on hospice care because those are curative treatments, but you can be on palliative care. Um, and the palliative services typically happen in, um, in the hospital. Um, and then what they have in common is that they provide comfort care, um, not only for the person um, who's experiencing the illness, but for the family as well, um, can reduce stress for the person and their family, um, can offer symptom relief related to a serious illness, um, including medication, including non-pharmacological things, um, and also physical and psychosocial relief. So I think those are really great services that um, they both offer. And so this article will tell you um, the differences, what's what's similar and different, so compare and contrast. And then there's also um, what's called a palliative performance scale. So we have a lot of scales in healthcare. And so this will um, give you, here we go. Um, it talks about, um, can the person walk? What is the activity level with evidence of the disease? Can they take care of themselves? Are they eating and drinking? Are they fully conscious? Um, and how many days on average, perhaps, do they have uh, to live? And so if you take somebody that uh, on the palliative performance scale who, um, let's see, who is um, mainly in bed, and they can't do any work, they've got pretty extensive disease, they need considerable assistance with their self-care, um, 
they have reduced intake. So a lot of times the people will have a, a gastrostomy tube, this tube that goes right into their stomach or a nasogastric tube that goes from their nose to their stomach. Um, they could also be um, on um, what's called total uh, parenteral nutrition. So it's like an IV um, that has fats and lipids as well as um, amino acids and proteins that, that go in that that would be considered curative. Um, so you would not have that if they were on hospice care. Um, and they could be, they're probably somewhat confused. And then it will tell you um, how many days survival post admission, days until patient death following admission, and those kind of things. And so then that tells you what um, their uh, palliative performance scale is. So you're pretty good if you're at 100%, but if you're at 40%, then um, death is probably, you can see the numbers get, get smaller, but death is closer. Um, and so I just thought that was a nice reference to, um, to be able to quantify that. Um, and then this is uh, an article just talks about symptoms and palliative sedation therapy. Again, not something that you have to um, memorize or know necessarily, but just know that um, I'll show you the, the form because um, it's like a long brochure, but it talks about um, being able to sedate the person and when you sedate and what do you sedate with. So that some of you might find that interesting. There's also, which I love, something called the modified caregiver strain. Oops, I didn't open that up yet. I will go back and look at that, um, which is actually a scale of telling you how much strain the family member is feeling. And so I think that's really important because I think sometimes people forget about that significant other or the person that's helping care for um, the person that's dying. So I like that one. I'll make sure that one opens up. Um, Living wills and advanced directives for medical decisions. You have two articles here that talk about um, these are the legal health care documents that's in your objective. And so um, they are legal documents. Um, you can do advanced directives as sort of the umbrella term. And you can do that at any age in case anything would happen. Um, and by planning ahead, you get what you want and you're in, in a fully conscious state of mind knowing what you want to um, be able to make that happen. Excuse me, so power of attorney, medical durable power of attorney is where um, it's in a type of advanced directive where you name a person to make decisions for you when you're unable to do so. So um, yeah, durable power of uh, attorney for healthcare, I believe in California is what it's called. Um, or you might also see a healthcare proxy. And so, um, the different names um, of the person. But basically what they can do is they can um, make decisions for you. So um, at one, uh, because I had that particular designation with my mother, I could call in hospice. I could ask them um, for more pain medication. I could, you know, talk about different, um, not treatment options, but palliative care options. Um, the doctor could give me information that wasn't a HIPAA violation. Um, because I was named as the um, healthcare proxy. It can be a spouse, it can be a friend, a family member, it can be someone, I don't know, in your community that you trust. Um, and you can also have more than one person um, in case one person isn't able to fulfill that, um, that role. So that's a person, power of attorney or proxy is a person. Um, a living will, it's, but it's a legal document because you have to sign the paperwork to, to appoint that person as your healthcare proxy. So that's why it's a document. Um, the living will is a legal document that tells, um, tells people what medical treatment you would or would not want to have. Um, you know, do you want to donate organs? Organ donation is a big thing. Um, you know, what kind of pain management do you want? Um, at what point would you want them to stop life support measures? Um, you know, and that's where your values, ethics, those kind of things all come into consideration. Um, and it's difficult because sometimes you want something different than what your family wants. And we have to go by what you put in the in your living will. So if you don't have a living will, then it becomes a very sticky situation. Hopefully couples, um, I think couples probably do. Partners will talk about what they want or what they don't want. Um, so they're fairly clear on that, but um, not always. Like I don't necessarily talk to my kids about that. Um, I mean, kind of have a little bit, but um, 
and you you want to talk about you know do you want CPR do you want them to um, you know be doing chest compressions and um, do you want to be on a ventilator do you want the feeding tube do you want them to do dialysis um, specific types types of medications or um, palliative care do you want to donate tissue donate your body to science those types of things are what is addressed in a living will. Um, do not resuscitate, do not intubate orders. Um, so that would be known as a DNR, do not resuscitate. Um, and that is a, um, I have an example, I think in the PowerPoint of a pulsed, the physician's order for life-sustaining treatment. And so, um, you know, you need to to say, uh, they'll, they'll ask, you know, is, are you do not resuscitate, are they DNR? Are they do not intubate? That's where they put the tube down. Um, to help you breathe. You don't necessarily have to be hooked up to a ventilator. It could be just to keep an open airway to help you breathe, or it could be hooked up to a ventilator. And so that's what you need to let people um, know what your wishes are. Um, and then it gives you diff the different ways to do that and resources. Um, you can change them. You can update them. Um, there's just specific ways that you um, need to do that. And then there's a post, which is the form it stays with you. Um, it's posted, it's supposed to be posted near your bed, but usually that means it's in the chart somewhere, usually the front of the chart. Um, but there's not always an easy way to figure out the code status of your client, especially in long-term care hospital. It's a lot easier. Um, but in long-term care, I always tell the students that it's part of their assessment. You've got to know. Um, and then in the house, oftentimes uh, you put it on the refrigerator. So that's right uh, in a main place in the house so that um, EMTs or paramedics can can see it. And I believe, yep, that was that one. Um, and then this is just another article, important healthcare documents that you must have. It's more of a, um, uh, I don't know, like a couple's perspective, not necessarily pro professional, but it has the same kind of things. Um, the HIPAA form they added in this one because you need to um, be able to say what family members they can release information to. Usually um, if it's a big family or even just a small family, there should be, um, you should suggest to the family to have one person be the point person that can receive the information and the person who is dying should have, um, should, uh, should have designated which family member so that not the whole entire family is calling the nursing station every five minutes to find out what's going on um, with grandma. Because um, then nothing happens. Um, so we talked about that. We talked about that, legal health care. And then um, these two uh, articles have to do with um, what nurses can do when patients die. And then one also on um, postmortem care. And so we talked a little bit like, do you cry? What do you what do? You do? And then it kind of depends on the situation. If you were in a code situation or whether you were maybe in long-term care, you expected the person was going to die. Um, it, it happens. Um, and it happens in the neonatal intensive care unit. It happens in labor and delivery. It happens on the dialysis unit. It happens everywhere in the hospital. Um, and, uh, we know they're coming and there's times we don't know they're coming. And so, um, this talks about different types of that and, um, how do you communicate that? Um, for example, like we, I remember one time we were in long-term care and the students actually noticed that the person's breathing was kind of changing and their level of consciousness consciousness changed. Um, and it was rather, an, it was a change of condition from when they came on at the beginning of the shift. And so they brought the nurse in, the nurse looked and the nurse had to make the call. She called hospice first. And then she called the, um, the family. Um, but I had the students listen because what do you say? How do you say that? Um, you know, uh, that we feel like you're, I'm calling because we feel like your father is, um, is nearing death. Um, his breathing has changed. This has happened. Um, and if, if people are going to come to say goodbye, this would be a good time to do that. Um, that particular family did not want to come in. Um, and so I actually had the students sit with them and that family was very, very happy that at least there was somebody at the bedside, um, to, to do that. Um, unexpected deaths, um, 
generally if it's an unexpected death and the family's not around and like in an emergency room situation and then the family shows up, I'm not going to tell them that as the nurse, it should be the attending physician. Um, who's ever running the code should let them know. Um, you need to tell them to get to the hospital if they're not there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, wait till they get there. Um, and then um, you can have the physician or two nurses, depending on the state, to call call it um, to listen one minute and no heartbeat is heard. Um, there was a time that um, many, many years ago, I was the housing supervisor at Nationwide Children's and we had a nine-year-old come in gunshot wound. Um, she got caught in the crossfire and she came in and I was the scribe and they worked on her like you wouldn't believe it was just everybody worked so hard to save her and uh we, we couldn't save her there was just too many holes in her heart um but the the mother the aunt and the mother had come in and they knew there was something wrong but uh they walked in on the code and i had gone right she and she had our, the girl had already passed and um, the mother just dropped to the floor sobbing and screaming and wailing. And that was her um, grief and mourning. Um, and we called a pastor to come um, and talk to her and be with her. Um, she wouldn't get up off the floor. And I must say that was like one of the, I will never forget that um, instance. And uh, I didn't know what else to do. I just, you know, stayed there, tried to make sure she was safe, kind of just stood there, kept saying, I'm sorry. Um, and it was really, it was really tough. Um, but uh, of we let her we cleaned the, the girl up a little bit because there was a lot of blood. Um, and then she and the aunt went in to, um, to see the child. Um, and things to do, right? Things to know. Um, don't remove lines and tubes um, if it's going to be a coroner's case or medical examiner's case. And if not, then you can remove lines and tubes. Um, it kind of tells you about that, things that you need to do. And then um, postmortem, oops, postmortem care. This one um, is a, they, it's from COVID, but it's a toolkit. It just tells you how to, um, it takes into uh, account cultural considerations of how to prepare a body or things to expect. And so I thought that might be um, interesting for you and how to, um, you know, make sure it's the right patient and you might do a, um, a bath or clean the body um, and then put that, you know, you will wrap them in a sheet and then put them in a body bag. Um, it's a little different for um, children or infants. They're usually wrapped in a sheet and then taken down to the morgue. Um, or the mortuary hopefully can come um, and take them from the unit. Uh, oftentimes we'll keep them on the unit um, because you have to have two people take them down to the, um, the morgue, which is in the basement of the hospital. Pretty scary. I've had to do that, go down with security in the middle of the night. Um, that was not fun. Um, and then there's our PowerPoints. And so there's also, make sure we covered that. Yes. There's also some videos here. I would say just know that um, they can be kind of difficult and depending, difficult to watch and depending on where you are, if you've experienced or are experiencing any um, grieving or losses or anticipatory grief, they may be kind of difficult to, um, to watch. So this one is about a nurse, um, who's dying from cancer and shares her experience with nursing students. So that's really cool that she, um, that she did that. And then these are kind of um, factual videos, what to expect in the final weeks and days of life, what death looks like in the final days. Um, these are all nurses that are talking about this. And then what do we see um, immediately before the person dies, the breathing will change, the color, the color will change. Um, their level of consciousness will change, different signs and symptoms, those kind of things. Um, so let me look at this one. We'll look at this one first. Let's see if it will download. Uh, let me do that. Okay, let's look at that one.
Okay. And some of this again may be um, repeat. So the um, objectives are there. Um, death is part of the life cycle, right? Um, signs and symptoms. So sometimes the person will actually start to withdraw, um, become quiet or restless because um, they know something's happening. Hearing's thought to be the last sense to be lost. So that's why I always like to talk um, to, excuse me, someone that's, um, excuse me, in the process of dying to provide some comfort, hopefully, to them. This will also give you some physical symptoms. Um, these would be sort of in the weeks, uh, days before death, physical symptoms. Um, the vital signs will change, decrease blood pressure, decrease urine output. Um, they might be incontinent of urine or stool. Um, sometimes um, I've seen where somebody, we know they're going to die, and then all of a sudden, mm, probably no more than three days before, um, they just kind of, it's almost like they wake up and like, oh, I feel better. Okay. And maybe they'll talk or they'll be more coherent. They might eat a little bit. And then, um, then they go right back, uh, to where they were prior to that. And so then I usually know within a couple of days, the person is going to pass. Um, you can also watch their vital signs. Um, the blood pressure will decrease. The pulse will slow. Um, the body will become cooler. Um, oftentimes there'll be a fever a couple days before the person dies and then they will cool off after that. Um, and you can just really, um, you can see the heart rate slow until it stops, um, which is really kind of an eerie feeling, um, having witnessed that. Um, if you look at these particular videos, when you run the, um, the slideshow, it will give you, um, different examples of how the breathing changes. There's um, a death rattle. It's kind of like there's fluid stuck in the throat. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hello. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not dying. Um, it's Petunia. Um, so the uh, the death rattle and then the um, chain stokes respirations are kind of like the person will be breathing. And they'll like hold their breath and you're like waiting for them to take another breath. And then eventually they will, but um, it's, you think maybe it's their last breath. You're not sure. Um, that can be kind of scary as well. And so um, you need to know the difference, the physiological death versus the psychological death. And so the physiological death is when the body processes start to decline. The psychological death is when the person is told that he or she has a terminal illness, for example. You can get down. Okay. Oh, yeah. There you go. Um, and then um, psychological responses of the dying patient, right? There's different tasks or the person feels led to, they have to get things done, kind of like, kind of like a bucket list, but like really getting all their um, paperwork or everything in order. Um, different grief processes. We talked about that in the first lesson. Um, and then perhaps prolonging life when desiring to be present at a family event. So sometimes I've seen where, um, there's a graduation or something, or like, uh, yeah, I've even seen nursing school graduations and the person, um, the student has told me that the person is dying and the student graduates. And then the next day or two days after that, the, the grandmother dies. So that's kind of, that's always interested me. Um, we went over those um, psychological uh, responses uh, in the dying patient. So they might lose self-esteem. You know, if you're diagnosed with a terminal illness, um, you may or may not know how long you have to live. You may get depressed. Um, so it's important to um, that therapeutic communication again, that we learned back in what week two, um, two or three and, and listening, just listen to them, you know, and, um, and wait, give them the time to transition. And then the family has to kind of do the same thing. They have to understand that um, this person is dying and they might feel helpless. 
um, or guilty for whatever reason. And um, we need to have therapeutic communication with the, um, with the family. Um, and depending on the setting, um, the family might feel helpless to help the person, um, which is normal. And so we just provide a lot of reassurance um, and resources. I like that, that picture because that's the, the person that passed. Um, cultural considerations. So the next couple slides have to do um, with um, cultural, some cultural considerations. There's a little video on that when you run the slideshow. Um, just be aware um, if there are any specific cultural practices that the family is requesting happen or if they would like to be there um, to do the, um, the post-mortem care. Um, this uh, priest is administering the last rites. That's a Catholic sacrament. Um, and so they may, uh, the family may want that done. There's usually, um, you could call the parish priest. They'll come. The parish priest will come to the, to the house if the person's at the house. Um, they'll go to the hospital. Um, they're usually pretty good about that. Um, if you are in persons in the hospital, um, you're looking at things. There's a lot of technology in the hospital. Excuse me, I've been doing a lot of talking. A lot of technology. So this has to do with the the um, the living will, things that the the patient wants done or not done. So do they want to remove life support? Do they want um, CPR or they do not resuscitate? Do they want to be intubated? Like it's nice to know those things ahead of time. Um, end of life hospice care. So this is great. The whole family's there um, with the person um, that looks maybe like the pastor reading from the Bible. Um, and so the hospice is great because it, it supports everybody, the patient and the family and really can address physical, psychological, spiritual, social, cultural, all kinds of needs, um, and help the family through the, um, the bereavement period. Um, palliative care, we talked about that already as well. Ethical and legal issues. Um, I know, I like this one. Let's have a straightforward conversation about you kicking the bucket. Um, that's where the bucket list <laughs> comes from, because you kick the bucket, you used to kick bucket um so legal issues rooted in the law like if you talk about um which will come here in the next um slide or two um euthanasia or physician assisted suicide you know what are the laws in different states um to do that and then um what are the cultural responsibilities cultural needs is there informed consent withdrawing life support that's an ethical issue um who makes that decision have they um made someone the healthcare proxy to make that decision. And so when you talk about the um, legal healthcare, the paperwork type of things, this is a, um, a graphic that I like because I think it puts things in pretty clear, um, in a clear picture. So advanced directives, when we talk about advanced directives, that's the umbrella term, right? And underneath that comes the living will uh, which we talked about, the healthcare power of attorney or health proxy and the, um, the do not resuscitate order in the post. Um, and then also if the, the person wants to donate any of their organs, there are there's paperwork that you can fill out um, ahead of time so that the um, organs can be um, harvested and taken where they need to be as quickly as possible so that they're viable and um, being able to be used by somebody else. Um, they'll get tested and all that kind of, those kind of things. And then um, assisted suicide and euthanasia, that's another legal ethical issue. So um, this would be the action of a person other than the patient to facilitate suicide, which is an intentional act that causes death. So states that have um, current death with, with dignity laws, um, which means that um, there is some way to to euthanize or have assisted suicides um, are these states listed here. New Mexico, because um, I did update this slide, New Mexico was in um, 2021. So I believe they were the newest state um, to pass those laws. Um, but it's still controversial. And some of the states that are on here, can't remember, I think Montana is one of them, um, 
they've had it on the books for a while because it got through several um, steps of legislation, but it's up again, or they're looking at it again, and it's not doing well. So some of these states may um, no longer have death with dignity laws, which I think just makes things more confusing because you had it, now you don't. And where do you go? Do you move to another state? Uh, what do you do? And so what is the role of the healthcare worker? Again, um, I love this one. Sometimes my job is hard. Sometimes my patients cry. Sometimes I cry with them. It's okay to cry with them. Um, so our job, make sure the family knows what's going on, make sure all the paperwork, informed consent, all those things are, are clear and signed, um, that we know what the cultural and personal wishes are and that those are respected. And then make sure that everybody on the team knows uh, about all those things. So if it's in a code situation, an emergent situation, we may not know all those things. So we can only do the best that we can do. And then as soon as somebody um, knows or somebody has that healthcare proxy, we can ask them, excuse me, and then uh, follow the wishes as best that we can. So different types of losses, um, loss of a spouse. Um, so it's two years, I see a lot of six months. Um, loss of a parent, loss of a child, um, a lot of blame and guilt. Uh, I've not lost a child. Uh, I couldn't even imagine that. Um, many people have, um, and an unborn child, um, you know, we will offer to let the parents see and hold the child, um, wrap them in blankets. Um, they'll oftentimes put them in a bassinet, keep them in the room. Um, we had one family that the mother wouldn't let the baby out of the room. We had another family um, that uh, didn't want the baby in the room. They wanted them out of the room. Um, and so uh, another one would, would be, um, that would be my, my husband coughing, sorry, um, loss of a sibling. So that can be at any age, right? Especially if it's a um, twin. My um, husband's nieces, my nieces, but on his side, um, are twins, were twins, and one of them got cancer uh, and passed. And it's been very difficult for um, a sibling. They're in their in their 30s, mid 30s, um, and it's it's difficult at at any age to lose a sibling. Uh, my brothers are 15 and 20 years older than I am. And I'm sure they're not going to be around too much longer. Um, and it's, it'll, it'll be tough. It's tough at any age. And then facing um, your own death in terms of um, you okay over there? Yikes. Um, sorry, keep going here, um, facing your own death. So talking about that generativity versus stagnation, as well as that ego integrity despair um, and immortality versus extinction. Um, it's, I don't know, it's different for everyone. Everybody looks at it differently. Some people are very, um, yep, I'm ready. And other people are terrified um, of dying. Um, all right, so moving on here, death of a child. Um, so I, I work with, with children a lot. I have over my 35 years as, of being a nurse. And children with chronic illnesses, I love working with them because they oftentimes don't know anything different than the chronic condition that they have. And so everything is, um, they're often very mature about it. I don't know if you ever see the, um, the ads uh, on TV, Shriners is one, but they also have it for um, the Danny Thomas uh, for the cancer, uh, St. Jude's Cancer um, Hospitals. And those kids, to hear them talking, it's just like almost an everyday kind of thing for them. Um, but you want to talk to them and educate them so that they know what's going on. And if they're afraid, um, you know, maybe they have a support animal or something, a toy or something, um, you know, usually one, if not both parents quit their jobs. Um, the sibling that is not ill, um, what was that movie? My sister's keeper, um, you know, feels left out and isolated a lot of times. So there's a lot of things to, um, to deal with, uh, when we're talking about the death of a, of a child. 
Um, but you want to be truthful. They know when you're lying. Um, yeah, remember the siblings empowerment as much power as the child can have is a good thing. Um, caregiver support, community resources, um, support groups, support blogs, support whatever you have available um, is important. And so we kind of talked about this already, but this is a little more, um, oops, sorry, a little more in depth. So the infant has no concept. The toddler um, will have separation anxiety. They're used to that, we'll say parent being there. Um, preschoolers, so what, three, four years old, they think it's magic. They think some grandma's gone away and is going to come back. School age children, maybe six, seven, eight, um, realize that death is permanent. Do they go to the funeral? Right. That's the tough question. Do they? And so, sure, you know, but they're not sure. They don't know that they're necessarily going to die. They just know that old people and adults right. die. And then um, teenagers, they know that death is final, but they think it's far away. So remember that our um, our teenagers are the ones that are drinking and driving. Not all of them. I don't mean to. I'm not saying that, but they they have this sort of sense of immortality. And so um, they don't think about it happening to them. They don't, oh, you know, yeah, well, so I'm not going to get in a car accident. I'm not going to, um, uh, yeah, get in an accident or nothing's going to happen to me because I'm, I'm a teenager. I'm okay. Um, so they know that it's final, uh, but far away. So when they see one of their friends die, for whatever reason, um, it really, really affects them because it makes it very real for them and they may not be ready. Uh, they're generally not ready um, for that, for the permanence of death uh, at that age. And then, um, you know, early adulthood um, concerns will um, surface intermittently. Again, um, looking at the missed opportunities, middle age, uh, you're thinking more of um, that that's kind of that sandwich generation where you're taking care of your kids and your parents. And so oftentimes, you know, that the, um, the death of your parents is coming and um, your own physical challenges are happening. And then old age, you're preparing uh, for death, hopefully in some way. Um, this is actually a picture of an Irish banshee um, who is, uh, <laughs> excuse me, um, a spirit that comes when um, is thought to come to take the soul uh, with them when the person's going to die. So a lot of times you'll hear um, or, or you're told that you'll hear the banshee crying when somebody, right before somebody dies. Because the banshee comes, the person dies, they take their soul. Um, at least that's what I was told growing, growing up in an Irish family. Um, and then physical care. There's another article on that in terms of postmortem care. Um, make sure you take the culture into consideration. Um, so I think that covers all of that. And then let me look at one more for you just to make sure. So this is actually out of um, one of our um, nursing textbooks. And um, these always have really long chapters in them. So when y'all get into nursing school, be ready for long chapters. Um, so this is just sort of an added one. Um, if you're interested or wanting to look to look through it, um, it talks about palliative care and end of life care. Um, I'm not going to go through it. You can go through it on your own time. The things I, I want you or need you to know are in the um, this death and dying end of life 2024 PowerPoint. And I told you about the videos and we went over that. We went over that. We went over that. So I do believe that is all of that information. All right, so let me stop sharing. Let me go ahead and leave the student view. So I'm back there. Hi, there we go. Um, and so what else do I have to tell you? So that's the, um, the third video for week eight, um, lesson 8.2 on dying and end of, uh, end of life care. You have your quiz focused areas. Those are in the first video and in the week eight module. You have your assignments and your journal entries. Um, and it's a really tough week. You know, it's, students have told me they don't like to do grief and death at the end of the, at the, end of the class. Um, I've done it both ways. I've started off or like put that in the middle and then 
gone into um, birth and prenatal and infant. Um, but uh, this summer, this that's just how it kind of worked out. So um, hopefully you'll take something with you or be able to use some of the um, suggestions or ideas presented um, if you have a situation similar to this um, that comes up. So um, it's been my pleasure and I will um, see you at some point.